Hello everyone, and welcome back. In this video, I'll show you how to create a Sankey diagram. Like the bar plot and scatter plot we've seen already, Sankey diagrams display quantitative information, but they do so in a way that also shows flow of that quantity between related entities. To see what I mean, here's a Sankey diagram showing the flow of votes between rounds of an instant runoff election. Each row of boxes represents a round of runoff. In an instant runoff election, voters rank candidates and at each round, at least one candidate is eliminated. The votes from eliminated candidates are then allocated to the highest remaining ranking candidate on those ballots. If no remaining candidate exists, the ballots are considered exhausted. We will be recreating this Sankey diagram from scratch. The data we need is in the vermontelection.json file. The JSON file encodes a list of objects. Each object represents a round of elimination. Each round has two fields, allocations and transfers. Allocations contains the remaining candidates and the number of ballots allocated to them in this round. Transfers represents the flow from the last round into this one. As usual, I'm going to start by loading the data. I'm also going to define a TypeScript schema for my data. Now I can tell TypeScript that I expect Vermont election.json to contain an array of rounds. There are two distinct visual elements in a Sankey diagram. There's the entities themselves, which are represented as rectangles, and there are the flow between the entities, which are represented as ribbons. Now that we have the data loaded, the first step will be to compute the location of the boxes. The width of each box is proportional to the number of votes each candidate has allocated to them in each round. The width of each ribbon also uses this scale. So the first thing we'll need to do is determine the scale we're using on the x-axis. That means we need to know the total number of votes in each round. I'm going to write a helper function to return the total number of votes for a given list of allocations. Our source data ensures that every round has the same number of votes. So we can just take the first round and count the number of votes in it. As a sanity check, I'm going to log that to the console. So we have a total of 8,980 votes. In order to calculate our scale, I'm going to define a width that we aim to fill. Now I can compute an x scale by dividing the width by the number of votes. There's a problem with this, though. If we took this approach, all of these boxes would be touching. What we really want is a little bit of space in between. There's going to be one of these spaces between each pair of entities in a round. The round with the most entities is always the first round, because candidates only ever get eliminated. So to make room for these gaps, I'm going to declare a constant that defines their width. I'm going to count the number of entities in the first round. Then I subtract the total width of the gaps from width when generating my scale. Note that I'm not using a D3 scale here because I don't need tick marks and this is just easier. Rather than pass the raw data from load data, in this case the result variable, I'm going to do some pre-processing and return two arrays. The first is an array describing the location of each entity box, and the second is an array describing the location of each transfer ribbon. I'm going to start with the entity blocks. So I'm going to loop over each round, and within each round, I'm going to loop over each allocation. I'm going to keep track of a single location along the x-axis. I'll initialize it to zero. The width of our entity box will be the x scale times the number of votes. In addition to the x position of the entity, I'll also pass the width and the round number. Once I've computed this, I'll return it from load data. To render these, I'm going to need to determine a height for each round as well. I'm going to define that up here. I'm also going to define a height for each bar. I can calculate an overall height by multiplying the round height by the number of rounds. 
I'll also add the bar height to this. And I'm going to return it from load data. As before, I'm going to use an await block. I'm going to construct an SVG element based on the height we returned. As usual, I'm going to give it a little border so we can see it during development. Now it's time to render each bar. forgot to add a return up here. I'm going to set Y based on the round number. And I also need to update X offset. There we go. I want to make this more snug. I forgot to subtract one from the length. Now the height takes up exactly what we need. Because each round has at least one fewer gap than the round before, the entities are all smushed to the left-hand side. I'd rather center them in the middle of the SVG. To do that, I'm going to modify X offset. I'm going to take the number of entities in the first round, subtract the number of entities in the current round, and multiply that by the gap width over two. Now each round is centered. All we have to do now is draw the ribbons. Every ribbon attaches to an entity in one round and flows to an entity in the next. They are positioned so that they don't overlap along the top or bottom edge of any box. To accomplish this, we're going to keep track of two X locations for each box, one along the top edge and one along the bottom. I'm going to call these top cursor and bottom cursor. Each will be a map from round number to candidate name to location. For each round, I'll create an empty map for the cursors in that round. Then whenever an entity is constructed, I will initialize both cursors. Now I'll loop over the transfers to create transfer objects. For each round, I'm interested in the bottom cursors from the previous round and the top cursors for this round. So I'm gonna use local variables to represent those for clarity. For each transfer, we need to keep track of the round that it goes to and from, the width, and the X position associated with each round. We also need to update the cursors so that this transfer ribbon does not overlap with other transfer ribbons we create later. Now we return an object representing this transfer. The entities are represented as boxes, so we used a built-in shape, rect, to draw them. The transfers have a more complex ribbon shape that doesn't correspond to a built-in SVG primitive. Instead, we can construct our own shape using a path expression. The path expression is a string of commands that describes a path through a series of coordinates. I'm going to write a function that takes the transfer object created here and outputs a path string representing the transfer ribbon. First, I'm going to create a TypeScript interface to describe this transfer object. There are four points we care about on the ribbon, the upper left, upper right, bottom left, and bottom right corners. The top and bottom edges of the ribbon are determined by the round number and the bar height. I'm gonna compute both. We already have the upper left and bottom left X positions, which are 
top x and bottom x respectively. But we'll need to compute the right sides by adding width to both. Now that we have these variables, we can begin to write the path string. A path string is sort of a simple program with a single piece of state, that state being a screen coordinate. To set that screen coordinate, we can use the command capital M, which is followed by an x and y position. Now we want to move in a horizontal line to the top right corner. This time, the path we move will be part of the path we're describing. That means if we apply a stroke to this path, the horizontal line will be included in that stroke. The horizontal line simply takes an x-coordinate. Now we want to draw a line to the bottom right corner of the ribbon. Don't worry about the curve yet. We'll get to that later. The command for this is a capital L, which again takes an x and y coordinate. Now we're going to draw another horizontal line to the bottom left corner. And finally, I'm going to use the Z command, or Z command if you prefer. That's going to take us back to our first position in the upper left-hand corner. Now I'll add another each block to the SVG to render the ribbons. I'll use the SVG path element to create the path. The path string is passed as a D parameter. I'm not going to fill it, but I'm going to give it a stroke. Let's see what that does. Now we can start to see this take shape. I'm going to replace the stroke with some fill so we can better see the shape. The only thing left to do is replace the straight edges with curves. In the next video, we'll do just that.